Hi, I'm Dan Heckman. I'm a fourth year medical student at Wayne State. And today I'm going to be giving you a lecture from the book Fundamentals of Microbiology. The first chapter is called Introduction to Bacteria. And we're going to start off by talking about bacterial cell envelopes. So just to give a brief overview of where bacteria fit in the whole scheme of microorganisms, um, microorganisms that cause disease or generate disease or generate pathology are called pathogens. So pathogens can be broken down into cellular and acellular pathogens. Cellular ones have genetic information and are able to replicate autonomously, whereas acellular pathogens are not able to do one or both of those things. Examples of those are viruses and prions, which we'll talk about in the future. We can further break down cellular pathogens into prokaryotes and eukaryotes. The fundamental difference between these two is that prokaryotes, if you remember from your cell biology courses, there's a thing in every cell that houses genetic information, and that's called a nucleus. Prokaryotes do not have a membrane-bound nucleus, and they also tend to be unicellular, whereas eukaryotes can be multicellular and are more complex. Examples of eukaryotes are fungi, protozoa, and helminths, and even humans fall under this category. Example of prokaryotes are bacteria that we'll talk about today. So how do we break bacteria down? Well, we do this based on a thing called a cell envelope, which stretches from the cytoplasm to the outside environment. And so we'll take a closer look at the cell envelope. And what we do is actually a test called a gram stain. And that's a test that, depending on the bacterial cell envelope, will break them down into either gram-positive bacteria or gram-negative. And so we're going to construct a cell envelope starting from the cytoplasm and working our way outwards. Both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria have, on the innermost layer, a phospholipid bilayer. So what does that mean? Well, bilayer means two layers, and two layers of what? Of phospholipids. So each phospholipid layer has a polar head on the outside and two uh, nonpolar tails, phospholipid tails on the inside. The polar head is on the outside because water is polar, and that's uh, in contact with the aqueous or water-filled area. So we'll keep moving here, and each gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria also has a cell wall that comes next. In gram-positive bacteria, the cell wall is much thicker, and this is made up of peptidoglycans, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Gram-negatives have a third layer, and it's another phospholipid bilayer on the outside. So how is this gram stain performed? Well, we start off by adding a crystal violet dye to both types of bacteria, and then an iodine dye, and then we do an alcohol and water wash which in gram-positive bacteria, the crystal violet and the iodine are retained. However, in the gram-negative, as we just saw there, it was washed away. So that's why we add a counter stain, a safranin counter stain to gram-negatives that gives them their red color. So gram-negatives are red, and gram-positives are purple, and that's a way we can actually remember them, what color they are, purple. The word purple starts with a P, and so does gram-positive. So moving on here, as we can see, there is a thinner cell wall in gram-negative bacteria. And that leaves this gap between the inner phospholipid bilayer and the cell wall. And this is called the periplasm. Now, why this is important is because this actually can house enzymes called beta-lactamases. And their name says what they do. They degrade beta-lactams, or beta-lactam antibiotics. And the prototype of beta-lactam antibiotics is penicillin. And so normally penicillin works by traveling through the cell envelope of gram-negatives and then acting on the cell wall to destroy them. However, if these gram-negatives possess beta-lactamases, they will degrade the penicillin and will not be destroyed. So let's get down into a, a little bit more detail of the mechanism of beta-lactams. And so we talked about that they act on the cell wall. So let's take a closer look at the cell wall. Now, the cell wall is made up of uh, peptidoglycans, as I said before, 
Now let's break this name down. Glycans means sugar. And so there's a sugar backbone in the cell wall of all bacteria made of N-acetylglucosamine, or NAG, and N-acetylmuramic acid, or NAM. Just alternating sugars of NAG and NAM and NAG and NAM. And then draped off of these, this sugar backbone are peptide side chains. This is where we get the word pep peptido from. Um, and, and these peptide side chains, as we see here, are cross-linked with these red bridges to one another by the enzyme transpeptidase. Trans means across, and peptid means peptide, so across peptides. That makes sense that this enz enzyme does this. So it sort of forms these little red bridges, these red cross-links. Now another name for this enzyme that we see here is called penicillin binding protein, or PBP. And that's because this is the enzyme that penicillin binds and inhibits. So if penicillin inhibits this enzyme, then these red cross-links are not going to be able to be formed, and then the cell wall will be compromised. Now the cell wall is very important because it provides a rigid support for all bacteria and also protects against osmotic damage. So if we take out the cell wall, then water will just be able to freely flow inside the bacteria and lyse them, which is not a good thing for them, but it's a good thing for us if we're trying to kill them. So let's, let's keep talking about the cell envelopes, and we're going to talk about some unique features to gram-negative cell envelopes. So first of all, they have these things called porins, which are cylindrical tube-like structures that connect the outside environment to the periplasm. And this is important because antibiotics, in order for them to work, they have to travel through the porins. However, bacteria, the gram-negatives, can actually change the composition of the porins so that antibiotics cannot make it through and cannot be effective in killing gram-negative bacteria. Another thing that gram-negatives have are little uh, spring-like structures called murine lipoproteins, and these connect the cell wall to the outer membrane. A third thing and very important thing that gram-negatives have are lipopolysaccharides in their outer membrane. Now this looks like a long word, but let's just break it down like we always do into lipo, which means it's part lipid, and polysaccharide, which means many sugars. So it has many sugars and it has lipids. So there's three main components to the lipopolysaccharides. The first we'll talk about is on the outside, and these are O-linked oligosaccharides. And the way to remember that they're on the outside is that it starts with an O, and so does the word outside. In the middle, we have a core polysaccharide. This is not as important. So we'll move on to the final segment, which is on the innermost layer, and this is called lipid A. This is where we get the lipo part of the word lipopolysaccharide. So lipid A. Another very important name for this is endotoxin. And the reason it's called endotoxin, endo means, is the Latin term which means within, because this toxin, it is a toxin and it's embedded within the outer membrane, as opposed to exotoxins, which are made by bacteria and excreted. So all you need to know about this right now is that this is a very potent toxin that can generate an incredible inflammatory response in whatever host it's present. So if there are bacteria disseminated all over the body of a patient, they can go into what's called septic shock. Um, and we'll talk about that later, but basically it can lead to death. Um, heart failure, fever, diarrhea, respiratory distress, and eventual death. And this is present in all gram-negative organisms, except it is present in one gram-positive organism called listeria. And listeria is important um, because it can cause septic shock in neonates. And a way to remember this is that listeria is at the end of the list. All right, so we'll keep talking now. We'll talk about one unique thing to gram-positives, and that is lipotechoic acid. And that is analogous to the gram-negative endotoxin because this can also generate an inflammatory response and lead to septic shock and potentially death. So let's now talk about things that both gram-negatives and positives have in common. First of which are flagella. Flagella are little tail-like structures, hollowed out tubes attached to uh, a basal body that anchors these tails to the cell envelopes of both gram-positives and negatives.
So this basal body acts like a rotor, which when it rotates, causes the tail to undulate and will propel the bacteria through a medium, possibly towards a nutrient source or away from danger. Next thing that they have in common are structures called pili or fimbriae. And I think of them as little grappling hooks because what they do is mediate the attachment of one bacterium to another and also bacteria to uh, foreign epithelial cells or foreign cells such as the urinary tract. Uh, a third thing that they both have in common are capsules. Capsules are dense, well-organized uh, shells, protective shells that are made up of polysaccharides or many sugars and except for one bacteria called Bacillus or B. anthracis that is made up of instead D. glutamate. This is commonly tested on board exams because it's the one exception to the rule. But its capsule is made up of D. glutamate rather than polysaccharides. But what these do actually is act like slimy um, protective shell and I sort of think of them as turning the bacteria into a slippery bar of soap that when the immune cells try to grab onto them they can't because they're so slippery um, and so what the host must do is actually stick things in the slippery bar of soap so like sort of like little toothpicks that will help their immune cells like macrophages grab onto and phagocytose this these slippery encapsulated bacteria and so what these toothpicks are are actually antibodies and if you remember from your immunology course there are two parts to antibodies and these are made remember antibodies are made from plasma cells which are immune cells in humans uh, there's an FC portion and an FAB portion fraction of the antibody and the FAB stands for antigen binding and the FC portion stands for constant fraction so what, what actually happens is the immune cells grab onto the FC portion, latch onto the antibody, and actually take up the entire bacterium and phagocytose it. And so there's another thing that acts like a little toothpick other than antibodies in it that is called C3B, which is part of the complement cascade. Both antibodies and C3B act as, are what is called opsonins, which basically means things that allow macrophages to latch on and consume bacteria. And this process is called opsonization. Now there are several organisms that are known to possess capsules and they are Shinskis, that's the way you can remember them through this acronym. Streptococcus pneumoniae, Haemophilus influenza type B, Neisseria meningitidis, Salmonella, Klebsiella pneumoniae, and group B strep. You should, all, you should definitely remember that these possess capsules. We'll talk about them in the future in more detail. So in this lecture, we discussed what's on the outside of bacteria. In the next lecture, we'll talk about what's on the inside.